Good morning and welcome to New Life Whitehall today. Thank you for joining us online to worship Jesus together and to celebrate his grace and mercy and love. I'm Jenny Davis and I'm so glad you're here with us today. Worshiping online is a bit different, but we're all still a family. So if you need prayer or help or can give help, or you feel led to contribute to supporting the ministry of this church financially, then locate and select the corresponding buttons on the New Life website screen and follow the directions there. Now, before we get, begin our worship team, before the worship team comes and leads us into a musical worship, uh, we want to begin our time together with some prayer. So let's all pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time together, God. We just praise you for this day. We thank you for the chance to come together online and hear your word. May your Lord, uh, may the Lord just put in our hearts um, what he wants us to know and to learn and fills us with his love and his grace and mercy again today. In Jesus' precious name, we thank you. Amen. Grace, what have you done? Murdered for me on that cross. Accused in absence of wrong. My sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so oh, my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. Death, where is your sting? Your power's as dead as my sin. The cross has taught me to live. In mercy, my heart now to sing. The day and its trouble shall come. I know that your strength is enough. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so oh, my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, wherever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, wherever the hope in my heart. And it's so of you Jesus it's all because of you Jesus it's all because of your love that my soul will live and it's all because of you Jesus it's all because of you Jesus it's all because of your love that my soul will live. Oh, to be like you. Give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like all I have just to know you. 
Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. final breath he gave as heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave a war on death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you
Welcome to New Life Whitehall. Yeah. Well, uh, as the worship team uh, uh, finds their way uh, to their seats, I just want to celebrate with you today the fact that Jesus is alive. Amen? It's great to worship Jesus together. I think the day is coming very soon when, if Christ doesn't return beforehand, we're going to be together again. We're going to be gathering to worship Christ together again. You know, our not worshiping together is a choice. It's a choice to love. By not uh, gathering, uh, hopefully we're helping to control the spread of coronavirus in our New Life Whitehall family. It's tough not to worship Jesus together as a family, isn't it? I think this past Sunday was the first Easter Sunday I've not been in uh, a church service worshiping Christ since I can remember. And uh, it wasn't, wasn't too fun. But the choice we're making today hopefully will eliminate uh, the virus from our midst. So enough of that. Well, the last couple of weeks, uh, we've obviously been talking about the resurrection and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God, took on human flesh and lived among us for 30 plus years. He experienced all the emotions, all the physical trials, all the intellectual and uh, struggles and all the temptations that you and I face every day. From the day he was born though, to the day he died, he loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And because he loved Christ, because he loved God, in that way, he didn't sin. He committed no sin because his love for God was so pure and holy and complete that he wasn't even motivated to sin. But the Bible says the soul that sins will die. But Jesus committed no sin, yet he chose to die on the cross for your sin and for my sin. And he, but on that third day after he was crucified, he arose from the dead, and he's alive to live forevermore. Amen? Amen? Well, last Sunday we discussed the moment that made a difference. You know, the very millisecond that Jesus opened his eyes was a moment that changed all of history, all of history past and all of history future. Impacted all life on this planet. It made a difference. It made a difference in Jesus as he reclaimed his authority, his complete authority as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It made a difference in the disciples as they became mighty warrior witnesses for Christ instead of the sniveling cowards they were hiding in the room, afraid they were going to be arrested. It made a difference in them. It also made a difference in the leadership of Israel. They couldn't accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They couldn't accept him as Lord. They, they couldn't accept that he rose from the dead even though they knew he did. And so they lost their authority. They lost their land. They lost their nation. They lost their power. And finally, I think we said it makes a difference in you and I today. It makes a difference in all of us today because Jesus Christ paid for our sin. And as he rose from the dead, He'll raise you and I up in the same way. We're not subject to death any longer if we believe and receive him. He'll raise us up in the same way he raised from the dead. His resurrection changed everything. Well, today I want us to consider the time that Jesus lived with us after his resurrection. He interacted with his followers 40 days and then he ascended back to the Father where presently he's performing probably an infinite number of, of things, but he's doing two things. One, he's building a house for all of those who receive him, who follow him, who, who choose to, to love and serve him. And then he's also sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and I, uh, functioning as a, as a high priest, representing us to God. But after his resurrection, 
He lived 40 days on this earth. And the only ones to see him, the only ones to touch him, the only ones to interact with him were those who he loved and those who loved him. There was no need to interact with the leaders of Israel uh, who rejected him and debate the law with them any longer. There was no reason to, to engage with the masses and because they were simply just looking for things from him. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Paul says that 500 plus people, his followers, saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. So what did Jesus do those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension? Well, the Bible doesn't give us a day-by-day -day detailed account, but it does describe five scenes that picture his activity. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John describe five different kind of little vignette scenes of, of what he did between his resurrection and his ascension. So I want to list them, and then we'll explore one. So some of the post-resurrection scenes in Scripture, the five scenes are this. First, Jesus' interaction with the women at the tomb. Matthew chapter 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20 give us varying accounts of the morning of Jesus' resurrection. And each account has a little bit different details. They all list different details of the incident. But it's obvious from the stories that early in the morning, probably before dawn, before the sun even came up, some women came to the tomb to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial. Because when they took him off the cross, it was almost the Sabbath day and they didn't have time to properly prepare him. So they were coming to the tomb to prepare him properly. Now, each of these four accounts have some minor differences, some, some details that are, that are different. Each story includes different things like different groups visited the tomb or how many angels did they see or who actually spoke with Jesus in the garden. Those were some of the different details in the story. And we could say that, well, these four guys wrote different stories, so the Bible's inaccurate. The Bible contradicts itself because the four accounts are different. But actually, that alone gives some uh, plausibility to the resurrection story because the writers of the Gospels could have gotten together in a conspiratorial fashion and, and decided what they were going to say, right? They could have made sure that no one was caught in a lie and so they'd get all their stories to, uh, together and they would all say the same thing. But they didn't, because they didn't make this story up. This was a true story. They, they recorded their eyewitness accounts or recorded someone else's eyewitness accounts of what happened that morning. It's kind of like a, a car accident. Let's say that, that in, in an intersection, a, a car accident occurs, and there's four people standing on the four different corners. And as the police officer interviews all of the eyewitnesses, they might tell a different, little bit different story. One might focus on the car that ran the intersection. One might focus on the way this car turned. One might focus on something else because they weren't making the story up. They all uh, were eyewitnesses of the same event from different perspectives. Well, the Gospels give us different perspectives of that morning. But having the different details actually gives the overall story the air of plausibility, and truthfulness. And all four Gospels include a, a version of that resurrection morning. The second scene is Jesus meeting with the disciples in a locked room. Luke 24, John 20 talk about how the risen Christ appeared in a locked room where the disciples were hiding out. They were uh, afraid after Jesus' crucifixion that they were going to be arrested too. So they were all locked away in, uh, in a room, hidden, out of sight, hopefully not being arrested. 
Jesus appears in their sight. And through that interaction, he proved to them that he was alive and it boosted their faith and their joy. And then there's the scene where Jesus meets two people on the road to Emmaus. Mark 16 and Luke 24 tell us how Jesus gave a detailed Bible lesson to to two people he met on the road as they were headed home to Emmaus. As they traveled, Jesus explained, expounded the Old Testament scriptures that prophesied about him, that talked about him, and he gave them a, a detailed understanding of all the events that had taken place in his life and how it was pointed out in Scripture. Now, they didn't recognize him as they were walking, as they were traveling, but when they went to the house and had dinner, Jesus broke the bread, and when he broke the bread, they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. This this scene proves that the Bible's all about Jesus. Luke 24, 27 says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. Jesus took the Old Testament scriptures and provided a detailed lesson on how it all points to him. Man, that's a, that's a, that's a Bible lesson, the Bible teaching time I'd like to have been a part of, right? A fourth scene is John talking about one day when Jesus meets the disciples by the seashore in John 21. And then last but not least, three of the Gospels and the book of Acts describe Jesus commissioning the disciples and ascends out of their sight. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and Acts chapter 1 discuss that last physical encounter that Jesus had with the disciples. He took them to a a high place and he gave them some last words. He was getting ready to leave and he knew he was going to be leaving them on their own and he he wanted to impart to them a, a very important message. And his command to them was, go into the whole world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. And he says, lo, I'm with you always. Now, he knew that he wasn't physically with them. He knew that uh, they would not be able to see him. They would not be able to touch him. They would not be able to to hear him. He said, go back to Jerusalem. What power from on high? Send someone to be with you. Ten days later, The Holy Spirit came and took up residence in the heart of all those who believe in him. And you and I today have that same Holy Spirit in us. We believe in Christ and he lives in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit is in you, empowering, guiding, directing, and drawing you to Jesus. So with these five scenes, Jesus interacts with and with those who love him and those who he loved, those who were with him during his ministry life. We have no stories of anyone else being healed, no more great sermons, no more debates with the leaders of Israel, just Jesus personally, intimately interacting with those who loved him. That's what being a child of God is, isn't it? Living, loving, interacting with a forgiving, gentle, loving, caring, kind Savior. Jesus' love and his forgiveness is clearly displayed as he meets the disciples in these different scenarios that we just talked about. You know, I was thinking breakfast is my favorite meal. I don't know what meal is your favorite, but my favorite meal is breakfast. I often meet people for breakfast, not any longer right now, but uh, when we're back together, I'll probably be meeting people for breakfast all the time. Breakfast is my favorite meal. And there was a breakfast meeting I would have loved to have been part of. Jesus served a great breakfast. 
Open your Bibles to John chapter 21, and let's read this story together. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, it says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered, no. And he said, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment. For he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out onto land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Well, this interaction of Jesus with his church is a living parable about how he engages with us his people, as we strive in the world. John 21 opens with some disciples on an all-night fishing trip. And it's directly connected to an event that was very similar that happened early on. When Jesus first called these men to follow him, they'd been fishing. And at that time, Jesus pointed to the symbolism and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The similarity of these two scenes is obvious. Luke 5 tells the story of the first encounter, and John 21 describes this last encounter. And both of these encounters, both of these times when Jesus comes to them where they were fishing, they've been fishing all night. Both times they had a frustrating night catching no fish. Both times Jesus commanded them to once again cast your net into the sea, and both times they obeyed. And both times the catch was almost more than their boat could hold. Both times Jesus shows his care for his followers. Jesus stands on the beach in increasing light and and he's interested in and he's caring for and he's directing and he's crowning with success the obedient work of his servants, toiling in the restless sea of life. By this time, the the whirlwind of the Passover week and and the numbing horror of the crucifixion had passed away. It had been replaced by victory and the joy of the empty tomb. Jesus had appeared to them. Through closed doors, they had seen him. They had touched him. They talked with him after he'd been dead in the grave for three days. They felt a surge of new hope. Well, at one point, Jesus told them to go to Galilee. So they took an 80-mile walk, and they were hanging out by the Sea of Galilee in Tiberias. And they needed decompression time. They needed some warm sun, some sea breeze, some time to, time to reflect on all, everything that had happened. We can imagine they probably talked about the future, They probably talked about the scriptures. They probably talked about the the mysteries that had been revealed to them. They probably talked a lot about Jesus, wondering when they would see him again, talked about, probably wondering what his next plan is, what are we going to do now, those kinds of things. But Peter, 
Peter was unable to resist the, the aroma of the sea air and the lapping waves of the water. He says, hey guys, I think I'm going to go fishing. The rest of them kind of thought, and they said, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do that. Yeah, boy, we're going to go catch some fish, right? Well, they get in a boat, and they go fishing. And nighttime was the best time to fish. So they spent all night on the water, casting the net, pulling it back, nothing. Casting the net, pulling it back, nothing. Try again, nothing. Try again, nothing. They caught nothing. They caught nothing but maybe, you know, some old license plates or a baseball or a rubber boot or maybe some weeds. But this night had gone the same route like so many fishing trips that start out in excitement and end in disappointment. All the work, all the effort, all night, nothing to show for. Well, we can draw some correlations from this story to the thought that the sea here represents the world. I mean, biblically, the, the sea is an image that represents the nations of the world. When you read in prophecy or any time in the Old Testament especially, when you see the sea mentioned, it's usually referring to, God referring to the nations of the world, the nations of people. So here we have the disciples, the church, toiling in the ever-changing sea and waves of the world. Their only stability is the boat representing the, the gospel, the words of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. The church is to be about the job of fishing. Fishing in the world for people to bring them into the boat. Jesus told the disciples from the beginning, follow me and I'll make you fishers of Fishing for souls of people, sharing the good news of the gospel, doing the work of evangelism. We can see that pictured in this scene. Evangelism, like fishing, is time consuming. It's hard work. You've got to apply intentional effort toward it. This scene points to the truth, though. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. These disciples were pros. I mean, remember, some of them were professional fishermen. They had their own fishing businesses before they followed Jesus. So they knew where the fish were. They knew how to catch the fish. They knew all the tricks and the methods. They, gave, they probably gave strict attention to their, to their equipment. There were no holes in their nets. They had a plan to catch fish, and they applied all-night effort toward that task, and yet they came up empty. When it comes to evangelism, we can, we can think we know what we can do. We, we know we have all our plans worked out. We have all our strategies worked out. But without Jesus, we can fish all night long and come up empty. The night was far spent. The disciples were probably ready to pack it in and say, that's it. Let's head back to shore. Unknown to them, though, Jesus was watching. and He had seen everything. He calls out to them. He says, children, do you have any fish? He uses the term that refers to a small child. Kind of odd, right? These grown, big, burly fishermen, and Jesus calls them little children. But he calls them children in his love for them. Because that's what we are to him. When we receive him and we believe on his name, the Bible says we become a child of God. Are you part of his family today? Are you one of his children today? As a loving father, he cares for us. His, his question there is one of care. He's about ready to do something. They didn't lie about it. They didn't try to tell some big fish story. They didn't make excuse. They just said, we've caught nothing. Jesus says, cast your net on the right side. And they did. And they caught 153 fish. And at that moment, they recognized Jesus. John says to Peter, it's the Lord. And in his excitement, Peter jumps in the water and swims to shore, leaving the crew to haul the fish to shore. They find that Jesus already has some fish growing on the fire. But he says, give me some of your catch, and we'll, we'll 
add that to, to what I'm already cooking here, we'll have some breakfast. The fishermen, a picture of the church toiling on the restless sea of life, realize it's Jesus who brings the increase. Apart from him, all our effort is a long night of labor with nothing to show for it. Serving Christ in our own strength leads to emptiness. But following his command, living in his spirit, obeying his direction fills our nets beyond measure. Well, Jesus didn't need the disciples' catch, did he? He already had fish grilling. But he accepts their labor. He accepts their results, and he added that to what he had already prepared. Jesus can catch fish without our effort. But he wants us to work alongside him. You know, Christ doesn't need you and I, but he desires to have you and I join him in what he's doing. He gives us the joy of joining him in work. That is his grace. That is his love in action. He's God. He doesn't need any of us at all, but he wants us to be part of what he's doing. He wants us to join him in his word and in his effort. Followers of Jesus, we're all in the same boat, riding the same waters of life. This present age of darkness, this, this, the water that, that we're uh, riding on could be stormy, could be uh, harsh, could be dark, could be cold. But we're all to be casting our nets. We're all to be honest about our results. No, we didn't catch anything. No excuses, no fish stories. We're all to be obedient to Jesus and his plan. As we do what we know to do, God takes care of the results. Our job is to be obedient and faithful to him. When John realizes who causes the catch of the 153 fish, he says, it is the Lord. He expresses the ideal for all of us as we toil through life. In the darkness, it is the Lord. In the light, it is the Lord. In success, it is the Lord. In failure, it is the Lord. In all of life, it is the Lord. Aren't you glad that after a hard night of labor, Jesus gives the results and provides the meal? God is love. God loves you. He expresses his love here in this scene. We see his love expressed even more so as the scene continues, though. Love is the key. Let's keep reading. Begin at verse 15. John 21, 15 says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, Feed my land said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus shows the disciples that they can do nothing without him. And he also shows them that he can provide things without any help from them. Jesus provided the great catch of, catch of fish, but then he already had some breakfast grilling. He makes the way because he loves us and cares for us. He also expresses his love by letting them contribute to the breakfast. He said, bring some of your catch to cook with what I already have cooking. We can't do anything. But he allows us to be part of what he's doing because he loves us. Then he continues to express that love in his conversation here with Peter. Through his interaction with Peter, Jesus does at least three things. He establishes some correct priorities he exemplifies true forgiveness and he lays out the mission. 
The disciples had gone up to Galilee for a little R&R. &R. The wind, the sea, the waves, the fishing, it was all therapeutic. The miracle catch of fish, thanks to Jesus, was even more therapeutic. There stood Peter after he jumped in the boat in the water and swam to shore, standing there before Jesus, wet after that frantic swim. That's an impulsive demonstration of his love for the one who had once called him the rock. But things for Peter weren't all good. He'd still failed the Lord. Now they were sitting around the fire having breakfast. A fish breakfast by the Sea of Galilee in Tiberias evokes a timeless, ethereal picture. Jesus sitting there with his back toward the glistening sea, serving breakfast on the beach to the damp crew of disciples in that, in that morning sea breeze. Verse 12 hints that there was little conversation. Something was different. The supernaturalness of this moment pervades everything. It was awkwardly silent as they sat huddled together around the fire, gazing timidly at Jesus, the mist rising up off the water. As they ate, Jesus addresses Peter. And think about Peter's situation here. Sometime earlier, before Jesus was crucified, Peter had made the greatest confession that could ever be made. In Matthew 16, Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then that night on the Last Supper, before Jesus was arrested and crucified, Peter declared, I'll never abandon you, Jesus. I'll always be here for you, buddy. You can count on me. I'm not going anywhere. Then just a few hours later, he declared, I don't know this man. I never knew this man. I don't know who you're referring to. He, with a curse, said, I never knew him. And at that last denial, they brought Jesus out and their eyes locked. Jesus knew what Peter had done. Peter knew what Peter had done. He went out and he wept bitterly. Unable to accept his complete and utter failure, he directly denied the one who he knew was God, who he swore he would never abandon. His own cowardice, his own fear, his own weakness caused him to commit a grave sin. One he probably felt he could never and would never be fully forgiven from. From his perspective, even if Jesus was alive, uh, things just wouldn't be the same. Sure, he'd seen the risen Christ. Sure, he'd heard his comforting words, peace be still, but he couldn't forget his lapse of love for Jesus. Had he disqualified himself? Could he ever be truly forgiven? Would Christ ever put any more trust in him? Would he ever be able to, to join the team again and, and, and preach the gospel again? Would he ever know peace again? As he sat there with Jesus, the fire crackled. The delicious fish melting in his mouth that Jesus had just cooked for him. These thoughts probably swirled around in his head as the smoke was swirling out of the fire. Have you ever been there? Have you ever failed Christ miserably or failed someone you love and you, and you wonder, can it ever be the way it was? Can I ever be forgiven? Can I ever be restored? Well, Jesus speaks up to Simon. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The question was calculated to hurt. And it did. Jesus called him Simon, his name before Jesus renamed him Peter. He was calling into question the title Peter the Rock. He was saying, Peter, do you remember your weakness? Do you remember your life before I met you, before you met me? Do you love me more than these other disciples? You know, in his self Centered pride, Peter had as much declared, Lord, I love you more than anyone else loves you. 
He was pretty proud of himself. Here Jesus challenges him on it. You know, sometimes we have to be hurt in order to be healed. I mean, think about it like a, uh, for example, like a burn patient, someone who's been severely burned. And the, the, the medical staff have to go in there and, and dress that wound and they have to clean it and kind of scrub it and get that burnt dead skin out of there and, and clean the wound and it really hurts and it creates lots of pain. But that, that cleansing is part of the healing process. Sometimes we have to be hurt right where we're hurt in order to be healed. Peter was hurt in his pride and Jesus just kind of said, ah, clean that wound out. Jesus was cleaning out the wound. Peter probably flashed back to the Last Supper, his declaration of love for Jesus, and then just hours later he betrayed him. Yes, Lord, you know I have an affection for you. The word Peter used was friendship or affection. He couldn't bring himself to say, yes, Lord, I love you, not after what he'd done. Peter's presumption and his pride were gone. Jesus said, okay, feed my lambs. In other words, then serve me. Jesus said again, Simon, do you love me? He dropped all the comparisons. In other words, do you really love me, Simon? That's the bottom line, isn't it? Do you really love Jesus today? Peter again professed his affection. Not full-blown love. Jesus tenderly says, well, then tend my sheep. Jesus' words were stark but gracious. Jesus was doing something wonderful for Peter here. He asked the third time, Simon, do you have a deep affection for me? Jesus took Peter at his word and, and acknowledged that he had an affection for him. And instead of asking, do you love me? He says, do you have an affection for me? Peter was grieved and again said, Lord, you know everything. You know I have affection for you. Jesus said, well, then feed my sheep. The restoration was complete, and all the disciples had seen it. They all probably understood that Jesus had planned it. Peter's denial happened before a fire, and now his confession happens before a fire. His forgiveness and his restoration before that fire. There were three denials. Now there were three confessions as well as three gracious commissions. With Jesus' commission to Peter, he was declaring his forgiveness by letting Peter know that he wasn't put up on the shelf. He was every bit the part of the mission. He was part of the team. Things were the way they were before his denial. He was saying, Peter, I called you to be a fisherman of men. That call still stands. He says, you have a place in my kingdom. You're still very much a part of me. Go feed my lambs. Go tend my sheep. Go feed my sheep. I love you. I forgive you. Peter's failure was the moment of change in his life. Before his denial, he was boastful, he was proud, he was arrogant, he was self-important, he was large and in charge. His denial of Jesus, though, was a crushing blow to all that, and it brought him to the place where he could receive true forgiveness and true transformation. Have you ever had a crushing moment like that in your life? A moment of complete failure where you realized that you weren't all you thought you were? Did you receive the loving forgiveness and transformation only Jesus can offer? If you've gone through that, certainly you can identify with Peter. If you're in the midst of trouble right now, Jesus is more than willing to forgive you. There's nothing that you can do that's outside his desire to love and to forgive you in the same way he forgave Peter. Nothing. Reach out to him in humble faith and he will forgive you. 
Jesus not only forgave and restored Peter in this moment, but he set the priority of love. First, it's do you love me? Then it's will you serve me? Our duty as followers of Jesus is to first love him with all that we are. Then we can serve him with all that we do. The priority of Jesus sits here for all of us, for all of us who believe in him, is doing for Christ must come after love for Christ. We so often jump to the do, don't we? But Jesus doesn't need our do. He already had fish on the grill. He didn't need their fish from the, from the sea that they just caught. But he let them contribute to what he'd already done. He lovingly added their catch to the breakfast. He didn't need it, but he wants us to love him. Love for Jesus drives mission for Jesus. All five scenes of Jesus after the resurrection display his love for and his forgiveness of us. They, they all point toward the mission of the church. The seashore scene paints a, a, a picture of being fishers of men, but that mission can only be fulfilled as we love Jesus first and then obey his plan. If we live with these priorities in place, he'll provide the catch. Here in Whitehall, we're praying for God to save 5,000 people in our community through the ministry of this church. Well, that's only going to happen as we love Jesus first. As we listen to his word and we obey his plan, that's the way it's going to happen. Only then will our nets be full. It begins with pure love for Jesus. That's the highest priority. I pray in your life that you've experienced moments of true forgiveness. When Jesus has spoken directly to you in love, saying, I forgive you. Love me. Join me in my work. I mean, imagine yourself sitting along the shore with him the sea of eternity stretching out in the glimmering light of morning as a shining backdrop. And Jesus looks at you with knowing eyes and says, do you love me? Do you really love me? Without comparing yourself to anyone else, do you really love me? Do you have an affection for me? How do we make our love for Christ the highest priority? Well, first, we need to be honest about our level of love for him. Do I really love him? And second, we need to spend time with him. The more time we spend with him, the more we'll love him. The, this coronavirus season is a, is a great time to spend quality time with Jesus. He loves you so much. After his resurrection, he engaged with only those who loved him and those who he loved. And I know in this season, he wants us now to engage with him. He wants to engage with you. Don't miss the chance to spend quiet moments with him. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, we come to you right now. And we thank you, Father, that you love us more than we can imagine. Jesus, you uh, are the forgiving, loving Lord. You are the one who truly forgives and who truly fills our hearts with, with grace and mercy. Lord, your desire for us is to be your children. Your desire for us, Lord, is to join your work, to join your efforts, Father, as we... Um, uh, love you and, and make serving you our priority. Father, we know that you can do this without us. But God, you give us the joy of being part of what you're doing. Lord, if there's any today that's listening to this sermon right now that don't know you or any that do know you that have failed miserably like Peter failed, Lord, let this be a day that we find true forgiveness and grace and mercy, because Jesus, you died on the cross, you rose from the dead, you've done it all for us, and you offer us your love and your grace freely today. Father, I pray that there'd be people out there that would accept your love and forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's
Continue worshiping Christ today. Lord of all creation Of the water, earth, and sky Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy. Holy Lord of heaven and earth Lord of heaven and earth Early in the morning Celebrate the light. And when I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. The God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. Universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. 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 Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. Holy, the universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy, the universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, you are holy, you are holy. Amen. Amen. Praise God. He is holy. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you so much for joining us today as we worship Christ together. And as I said when I first started uh, the sermon, I said, uh, uh, it's not going to be long before we're going to be together again. I am praying that that's the case. But until then, stay true to God, stay with Him, spend quality time with Jesus. We have this opportunity right now to just spend quiet moments with Him. Don't miss this chance. Now, God's Word's always the last word. And I was wanting to read the last part of the words when Jesus was on that high place, standing there with those disciples, getting ready to ascend to the Father, and he says, go into all the world. His very last words were, behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's with you today. God bless you. See you next time.